What's up everybody, Alex here. Welcome back to another video. 10 albums that changed my life. Uh, this is a, I, I guess a, a thread that's kind of going around. It, it kind of goes around every year. Um, sometimes in the people who show records or CDs or, or, or nothing, what, whatever it is. Um, I don't actually know who created it, but it's a you know pretty generic sort of idea. But the idea is, is that these 10 records or however many we decide to show um, changed our lives or had some sort of meaningful impact on our lives or, or something like that, right? And I think what I've really enjoyed watching about these videos is everybody's different interpretation of what that means and, and how people associate music and records or albums with uh, their, their lives and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm going to take a stab at it. And I think, you know, for people who watch my channel, this might be a little bit uh, different because, you know, most of the time you're probably used to me making, you know, stupid jokes or whatever. And well, you're always going to get that. But um, I'll, I'll be sharing a little bit more about my kind of personal life and journey with music uh, through sort of taking you through these 10 albums. So, um, you know, with that comes obviously some struggle and, and joy and, and all the different things that life presents us. But uh, yeah, I guess we will sort of jump in. We'll go chronologically. So I, I think when I look back at, you know, the first time I listened to an album, and I'm talking like, you know, when I got into like rock music, classic rock, all that kind of stuff, you know, take away like whatever I was listening to when I was like eight, nine, ten, or whatever, whatever was on the radio at the time. But when I really started getting into, you know, this thing called rock and roll, I distinctly remember probably the first album I got into. And, and this is an album that is one of the highest selling albums of all time. This is not an original pick here, but specifically the reason it means so much to me is for two reasons. A, again, it was an album, one of the first albums I remember listening to so much, and I remember it being such a favorite record of my dad's, um, who was someone I shared, you know, obviously musical interests with um, while he was still around. Um, but for me, I remember specifically being in, gosh, I was maybe eighth grade or grade eight, as the Canadians call it. Um, so maybe 13, 14, and it was the, it was the Boston debut. Now, I mean, half of these songs are still staples on FM radio, right? But to me, I was like, what an amazing sort of album to start with in terms of, uh, just getting you into, into the, the music, right? And what I mean by that is that a, you know, perfect songwriting, right? I mean, opens with more than a feeling, peace of mind, again, such a radio staple, foreplay long time radio staple. You still hear rock and roll bands smoking, uh, even, you know, the deeper cuts. I've always loved Let Me Take You Home Tonight. All, just a perfect record, a perfect debut. It sold a billion records or whatever it is. What I've appreciated about this, though, is, again, perfect songwriting. It had the FM hits. The production on this is just insane. I mean, layers upon layers of vocals and, you know, tracking six guitars, the sound of everything was just was just perfect. I mean, this was like one of the first, like sort of, it was an aural experience really listening to this. And, and again, I remember sharing a lot of moments uh, on this record or with this record with, with my dad, who I'll, I'll talk about here in a little bit too. So um, yeah, this is kind of like the first record I remember getting really into. And um, I mean, classic cover too, just awesome. So yeah, absolutely. That Boston debut was perfect. Um, sometime a little bit later then, and I'm cheating a little bit here because I'll, I'll show two records because they, they both went hand in hand and they're one's right after the other and it's the same artist, but I don't know what it is. I have no idea how I made the jump from like Boston and FM hits to getting into this band. They've become one of my favorite bands of all time. Um, and this one, two punch from them is outstanding. And so again, right around the age of like four, 13, 14 or so getting into music, um, these two records somehow came along. Um, Jethro Tull's Aqualung and then the one that followed right after it, Thick as a Brick. Um, specifically, just remember some amazing uh, experiences just growing up with my older brother, who uh, is a great supporter of the show. Of the show. Um, it just, uh, we would sit around, again, I was 13, he was probably 16, um, and we were just sitting around, you know, being brothers and whatever, and playing video games or making fun of each other, or getting in fights or whatever it was. But we had this tradition where we would put this record on and we just thought this was the first time we heard anything that was like, of course now, you know, it's prog, but at the time it was just like, how cool is this? It is one continuous song. 
Um, and it took me you know, several years later that the whole time we were only listening to like part one. Rarely did we listen to part two. Um, but, you know, along with that, I was listening to Aqualong around the same exact time. Again, no idea why, how these got put into our laps um, or why we listen to them so much. This, I think, has become the album that I'm more fond of. I mean, I love this, obviously, but this has become one of my favorite records of all time. Um, really feel like kind of know it inside out. But again, it was just interesting at that time. It wasn't prog. It was just it was just cool rock music and the first time hearing a lot of these different things. So, um, yeah, that was definitely some records that I really remember diving into that sort of opened my mind up to a lot of different stuff out there. I've talked a lot about this artist before, and so I won't spend as much time on this, but as many of you know, that the first band I fell in love with that obviously they'll always play such a meaningful role in my life, but I think more importantly, they're the first artist that brought sort of passion to this thing called music, right? It, it was the first artist I had to search the internet for, which was a different thing in like the early mid 2000s. Like I had to know when they were playing, where they were playing. I had to know everybody's name. I had to know all of this stuff. And that has since sort of, you know, really uh, carried over to a lot of other different artists. But for me, the first band and artist that did that was Def Leppard. And this is, of course, their mega super seller, whatever you want to, you know, call it a masterpiece or call it when they sold out or whatever you want to call it. I don't care. Um, but this is Def Leppard's Hysteria from 1987. Yeah, I mean, they were, again, I was probably 14, 15, and they were the first band I truly, really just fell completely in love with. At that time, I don't know, again, I was, probably would have been different if I was older or something, but for me, it was like, I'd never heard such a cool combination of hard rock, cool riffs, you know, gang vocals, but with this sense of melody. I mean, there was this, this idea of all these harmonies going on, all these hooks, I mean, every... The verse, chorus, bridge, everything was a hook. They had so many different melodies going on. I know a lot of people kind of trash the production of this uh, because it's so late 80s, and it is. But to me, it was like hearing this, I was like, I had never heard sounds like that. I had never heard a record made that way. And so this record will always play such a meaningful role for me because it was the first record and band I fell in love with. And it's since opened so many other doors as I've gone on. So yeah, this is probably right around when I'm 15 or so hearing this. And man, what a time. Fast forward a couple years when I get into a lot of different stuff, right? Getting into Led Zeppelin or getting into David Bowie, you know, the kind of the, all the classic rock staples. Um, but I remember specifically being later high school, maybe, you know, maybe I was a junior. So I was probably 16, 17 at the time. And I was hanging out with uh, my brother, was in a band and I was hanging out with him and his friends and they were cruising around their Ford Focus or whatever it was at the time. And this was in the CD player. And I remember being like, I like that band. Because I remember my parents having like a greatest hits compilation when I was growing up. But I was like, I've never heard anything like this before. This is truly like a, I feel like I'm listening to a play while this music was going on. And uh, they've since become one of my favorite bands of all time. And this is one of my favorites. And that's uh, Queen's A Night at the Opera. Again, I mean, I remember hearing like that intro to uh, Death on Two Legs and just being like, wow, this is wild. And of course, everybody knows, um, you know, You're My Best Friend was a huge hit on here. And of course, everybody knows Bohemian Rhapsody. The wild thing is Bohemian Rhapsody, as overplayed, but also as brilliant and creative as it is, isn't even the wildest song on here. I remember hearing the Prophet song and thinking, this is absurd. But then you hear 39 and Brian May, it, like this record why it's so important to me is that this was the first record i heard that opened my eyes to falling in love with music and artists that stretched all boundaries right like there's a there's pop on here there's classical on here there's prog on here there's hard heavy rock on here i mean you go in to death on, from death on two legs which is a great rock that starts it off lazy on a sunday afternoon which is just this like hoo -da, hoo -da, into I'm in love with my car that the drummer sings. I mean, that Roger Taylor sings. It's like heavy, you know, and it just keeps going. You have Seaside Rendezvous with a kazoo solo. This record means so much to me because it opened my eyes and ears to, to artists and appreciating them for stretching out so far. And Queen, obviously, were the absolute masters of that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this album still means so much to me, but I remember hearing this when I was 16 or 17 and being like, holy shit. I'm all in. And I still feel that way today. 
And I think a perfect segue into this next band that is a lot, a lot of you probably know is my favorite band of all time. And this enters into when I really started getting into them, which was when I was um, 17. I was a junior, I believe, in high school, 17 years old. And I had a friend who I was in a band with who recommended these guys. Uh, he was a shredder. I mean, he was an absolute shredder guitar player. Um, he goes, you ever listen to these guys? I said, no. But, you know, the following week I went to Best Buy or Circuit City. God, that's a throwback. And I uh, called him. And I said, hey, here are the CDs that they have. What should I, if I'm trying to get into this band, what should I get? And he says, you've got to get that one. And since that time, I have not looked back. And they've been my favorite band ever since. That record was Metropolis Part 2, Scenes from a Memory from Dream Theater from 1999. Um, you know, arguably what people will call the, the best or the, the pinnacle of progressive metal. If you're going to get into progressive metal music, this is the one to get. Uh, you know, obviously there's some other great other ones up there as well, but a lot of people will say this. Kind of rolling off the Queen Night of the Opera thing, to me, it was like, when I was listening to this, I, I still, I didn't know what Prague was. You know, I wasn't listening to Yes or Genesis or, you know, I, I didn't know what Prague was. To me, when I listened to this record, though, I felt like I was watching, or I felt like I was listening to, like, a heavy metal version of an interpretation of Phantom at the Opera. I mean, it had strings, it had choirs, it had all of these noises, it had a whole storyline, it had male, female vote. I mean, it had everything. And of course, you know, if you know the story, like that's sort of how it's played out. But for me, I was like, again, this was not progressive metal. I didn't even know what Prague was at the time. To me, I felt like I was watching a show. I was watching, I was in a the theatrical performance watching this all go down. And I still feel that way listening to uh, to this record today. And so it's always interesting, you know, Dream Theater gets kind of lumped into the overindulgent, widdly widdly, you know, they're not playing for the song kind of thing. And, and I always get, I don't know, it always hits me in a weird way because like I was never into that stuff and I'm still not. To me, this was an emotional experience where it felt like I was witnessing a cinematic show orally, which had never happened before and I haven't looked back since. So there you go. Fast forward to, I guess, my senior year of high school. Um, there were some family issues going around. So entering into my senior year of high school, I moved uh, from Ohio to Indiana to live with my dad. Um, and so some obviously parental separation was going on and uh, it, it was... <laughs> It was a pretty rough time. I'm not gonna lie to you. Uh, it was a pretty shitty time. Let's let's pour. Actually, let's pour one out for uh, 2007. Hey. Mm. <sighs> yeah, let's pour it out for there. So, tough time. Moving to a different state for my senior year of high school, and I'm leaving uh, just the best friends in the world. I mean, I remember having such a close knit group of friends that when we knew that I was going to be leaving in a few months to move, we just spent as much time as possible together. And me and a friend specifically, I don't, I don't talk to him as much anymore. Maybe every once in a while on Instagram, I don't think he's watching, but his name's Corey and he will always remain one of my most important friends. When I was in high school, we were in bands together, hung out all the time. And specifically we bonded big time over this band, but specifically this album. And that is Counting Crows is, August and everything after. And this is still one of my favorite albums of all time. I We listened to this damn near three times a day over and I mean, it was, I, yeah, I mean, and, and it, it's interesting too thinking about it because it was such a bittersweet, sad, emotional part of my life and his, you know, watching his friend leave too. And that's what this album is. I mean, this is a sad, dark, depressing album. Um, you know, you have the huge hit, Mr. Jones, um, round here, one of the saddest songs ever. That was a semi hit Omaha semi hit, but you do God side perfect blue buildings, sad Anna begins sad time and time again, saddest, uh, you know, but we really kind of bonded over, um, Sullivan street and raining in Baltimore. We're just two of our favorite songs. And every time I listen to this album, I still go back to that time in high school and, leaving my friends for, you know, kind of what I thought was the better decision to be with, uh, with my dad, um, which I'll, I'll talk about here in a little bit. So yeah, Counting Crows, August and everything after. So short, shortly thereafter, after, uh, moving to Indiana to be with my dad, um, 
uh, about, I guess, uh, a couple years later, he would end up uh, passing away unexpectedly. Um, and at that time, it was sort of a pretty big um, trial and tribulation period in, uh, in me and my family's life, obviously. But specifically, remember, it really um, impacting, obviously, the relationship that I had with my siblings, but especially my little sister. And, uh, you know, she's, hi, Carly, you know, just a uh, she really does mean everything to me. And so much of that is based on what our past is and our relationship now. Um, but I, I think to me, an album that has always brought us together so much uh, was because shortly thereafter, after my dad, our dad passed away, um, her and I went uh, a couple of few months later to see Trans-Siberian Orchestra in concert and uh, just was the most amazing experience ever. And I, I'm all in on TSO and trans Siberian Orchestra, but this is Christmas Eve and other stories, their sort of debut from 97, I believe. Um, you know, uh, they have given sort of a, they have brought a light to the holiday season that uh, was previously and is typically shrouded in some darkness, just given the family situation. And the way that they are able to pull together these different values of music and holiday music, but... You know, if you know their history, they came from like a heavy metal side, um, but then the storytelling and elements of faith that I'm not even into, but elements of hope that I'm certainly not into, but they're able to do all these things. But for us and, you know, Carly, if you end up watching this, you know, you know that the song on here that means everything and there's so many to us is uh, Old City Bar. I mean, it's just... I mean, talk about just a tearjerker and just a great song and something we listen to every year. And uh, I'll always associate this record and this music with the relationship I have with my sister that may have really started so much out of some pretty tragic happenings, uh, but has since sort of, uh, you know, blossomed into such a, a, a great relationship. So Carly, this one's for you. Um, love you. What's interesting now about that as we sort of... Uh, fast forward is somewhere between the years of like 2000 and uh, I guess 10, uh, 2010, 2011 to probably like 2016, 17. I was not into a whole lot of music. I was going through college. Um, so it was a lot of whatever's playing at the parties or the clubs or whatever. I was in grad school. So it was whatever we were just sort of streaming at the time. Um, I was not, I wasn't into a ton of music. I wasn't researching anything I, I sort of fell off and I wasn't going to many concerts but something clicked in about 20 2017 2018 that really reignited and refueled me big time and this is a complete random thing I'd be surprised if anybody showed these records but uh, you know uh, not to go down the whole rabbit hole but obviously mentioned Dream Theater in 2010 Mike Portnoy left Dream Theater and did about 400 other projects he has since returned awesome. But one of the projects that he really got into was partnering up with the great Neil Morris, previously of Spock's Beard and Transatlantic and all these other great groups. Um, and they started recording albums under the Neil Morse band. And I uh, was living in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time. And the Neil Morse band was coming through town playing at this super tiny club. I mean, we're, we're talking maybe two, 300 people. And I was like, oh, it would be great to go see Mike. That's it. It would just be cool to see Mike Portnoy play again. Hadn't seen him play in, God, eight or nine years since he left Dream Theater. I, how cool would it be to see Mike play? And so I bought tickets and I said, well, you don't know anything about the music. You should probably listen to some of the music. So I listened to the music and I'm blown away. I'm going to do kind of a double shot because the record that blew me away when I heard it it was called, uh, it was called The Similitude of a Dream. This is a prog rock masterpiece. I mean, I will put this up in the same category as the greatest prog rock albums of all time. I kid you not. And, and Mike has said the same thing. Of all the things he has done, he will put this up there as one of the greatest albums of all time. And I couldn't agree more. And then I actually saw them on this tour, The Great Adventure which is up there as well, an absolutely amazing record. So it's kind of a double shot. And here's why it was so important. I got to see them. I got to meet them all afterwards. Uh, for me, it was the first show I had gone to by myself. I had said no to a million other shows before because I didn't want to go by myself, but it was the first one I went to by myself. And it completely reignited this music thing. I, I fell in love with music and in live music and in bands and artists and exploration again and again. It, like it was the complete full circle moment for me. And so, 
in terms of importance, these will always be so important, not only because I love the records and they're amazing records, but because listening to them and seeing them live and sort of taking that shot completely blew my mind and just re, uh, retooled everything for me in the best way. Sort of along the same time, maybe a couple years later, so now we're kind of tipping into you know 2019-ish or so. And again, it's interesting that now we're getting into like the prog world because I, I never really saw myself as gravitating towards prog. I always felt myself gravitating towards music that make, made me feel something. I loved the story, the concept. Like that's the type of stuff that I really love, not necessarily the, com the complexity or the virtuosity or anything like that. And this to me, uh, this is one of my favorite albums of all time, like so many of these other ones. Uh, but this is probably a top five album for me of all time. And I think so much of it is because, yeah, musically, it's brilliant. Uh, sonically, it's one of the best sounding records of all time. Um, this guy is just a complete chameleon and does whatever he wants to and typically is great at it all the time. But for me, this was an album that brought me back to when I listened to this album still to this day. And the first time I heard it, it made me feel something. It made me feel an emotion, a tug, a pull, and it still does. And to me, that's what music is still all about. And that's Hand Cannot Erase from Stephen Wilson. This was released in 2015, but again, I probably didn't listen to this until 2019 or so. Um, you know, if you know the concept, it's loosely based on a concept of a woman in, uh, in England who um, seemed fine, everything was fine, but just uh, ended up passing away in her apartment and nobody knew and nobody cared and nobody called or checked on her and nobody found her until like, months later or something. I mean, it's a tragic, tragic story and sort of loosely, loosely based on that. But this is an album of guilt and of um, grief and shame. And, and th there's an element of, again, of emotion that is elicited every time I listen to this record, um, especially on that final track. You know, th there's just so much about this record that, again, is not, uh, it's not a feel good record. And that's okay. Because it, again, for me, that's the power and the beauty of music is what it can do, um, both in terms of what it brings us maybe positively, but also what it makes us think about in a different way and in a deeper way. So um, for me, this is a perfect record, a top five record of all time for me. It will always be that way, but specifically when I look back at how it changed my life, it reminded me that music is about how it makes you feel. At the end of the day, the music's great, the instrumentation's great, the singers are great, whatever it is. Music is about how it makes us feel. And I don't think there's a record that makes me feel much more than what this one does. Hand Cannot Erase uh, from Stephen Wilson. So now we get to number 10. And this was an interesting one because I kind of had to think about what is the album that came out recently or an album that I've gotten into semi-recently that's played such a big role. Well, up to this point, I was just a huge rock fan, hard rock fan, prog fan, metal fan, whatever you want to call it. Um, but a lot of modern music I was not as into. I just was, I was basically a boomer. Hi, boomers, where I was like, nah, new music sucks. I have no idea how these guys got put on my radar. I think I probably just heard a song and I was like, that's a good song. I want to stream that album. I streamed that album and I was like, oh, I'm into this. I've shown these guys before. They're probably the band that I've been most into over the last couple of few years. They're a modern, call them indie, although they're not indie because they're signed to like Atlantic. But, um, you know, call them uh synthy psychedelic pop there's elements of americana there's heartland rock whatever it is i've talked about them before but the band is the war on drugs and for me the album that meant so much to me is lost in the dream um they're all great i love all their albums even the early stuff with like kurt vile where it's a little bit more droney but for me i, I just like the songs on this the most and again um, it's not the happiest shit in the world, shocker. But but for me, the songs on here have always just elicited something more. Um, you know, specifically the title track, Lost in the Dream, and then In Reverse. I mean, the, these songs that just, I don't know. It's hard to explain what they do, but like I said before, that's what music's all about is sort of how it makes you feel and the emotion it it's elicits. And again, I got a chance to see these guys here in Columbus uh, a couple years ago. And I was just sitting there in sort of like this emotional cloud, you know, um, just absolutely great. I love these guys. And um, yeah, this was the album for me that still I could listen to day in, day out all the time. And uh, yeah, I just love it. So Lost in the Dream from the War on Drugs. This came out, what, 2017-ish maybe? 2014. Close enough. 
Um, so yeah, there you go, friends. Uh, those are my 10 or 11 or how many albums I showed. Um, hopefully more people I know that jump on this. I just love to hear these stories and love to hear what uh, people are into. So thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging around. Let me know what you think or what your albums that might have changed your life or played a big important role in your life as you've uh, grown. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll talk soon. We'll see you on the next one. And cheers, everybody. Bye.